fundamentally, sales is about relationships. I just like meeting different people. And generally, we'll always say, business does come off the back of it, but we don't necessarily need to always be talking about, yeah. hey, this is what we do, come and talk to us. It's more about just chatting to somebody and saying, well, you know, what do you do? We do this. You yeah, can have all the connections in the world, but if you don't know how to, you don't know how to use them or work yeah. with them, it's useless. Literally, I was in Warwick Hospital with a notepad when I came up with this idea. In this Sports and Outdoor Mentors episode, I chat with Dave Birch, founder and CEO of Endurance Zone, the world's largest sports rewards, loyalty and engagement platform. We chat about how a serious back injury derailed his professional rugby career that led to the inspiration behind his business today. We chat about scaling the business, finding the right co-founders, getting external funding that adds more value than just financial and much more. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you do, please like and comment. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. So, Dave, great to finally have the chance to sit down and speak. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while, so it's great uh, to be able to come here and check out your uh, amazing offices and the place where you're working. Pretty cool place. So that's uh, yeah, we like it here. It's pretty cool. I but can yeah, imagine. no, great to great to finally get together. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe let's start with. What would you like actually the audience to kind of get out of this discussion? Is there, you know, what would you like to kind of share in terms of uh, you know, something that you think could benefit the, the audience? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, it's a, an understanding of uh, two things, you know, who, who is endurance and what, what, what do we do? But I guess more importantly, the journey as to why we got here, because I think classic you know, entrepreneurship is around you've identified something that has affected you, there's a problem that you've identified, and then you just try and fix it yourself, right? And um, so I think it's that, you know, where, where did we start from and why did we start it? What was the problem that we were trying to fix yeah. and where have we got to? Because I'll tell you what it was when we first thought it was, it's not where we are now. Okay, interesting, <laughs> so, interesting. Okay, great. Well, we'll spend we'll spend most of the next hour or so talking about endurance zone, but before we get to that, I thought it'd be great to give the audience a, a little bit of background to kind of understand where you've come from, as it were. <laughs> and I guess the story probably starts with rugby. Obviously, you played rugby at an elite level a couple of times, a few times, I believe, with England even. Uh, yeah, a few England caps on them about, yeah. So that's uh, pretty amazing. So, and I guess as with everything, you know, playing sport at that sort of level, you go through your highs and your lows. And you've stated before that, you know, you're somebody that's very competitive, and I'm sure that. Yeah. got you through many of those kind of low times but I'm wondering because in the end I think it was a quite a serious injury injury that stopped you yeah. playing rugby so how did you handle that I mean mentally that must have been I would imagine a pretty tough period for you other than obviously physically as well which goes without saying yeah I mean the, uh, it uh, I had um, two dish removed and my spine fused um, which uh, was very painful and a, a pretty pretty extensive recovery period but um do you, it's really interesting this one because having played rugby I am competitive but I'm also a super positive person and even even my board will say to me like I don't understand how you stay positive all the time <laughs> like it's just I think when people start thinking about negativity and negative thoughts come in it actually can take over the whole the whole being and the whole life and actually for me it's about look that's you can't change that outcome now so how do we make the best of it so I think that's probably an element of Sadness around I've stopped playing, but at the same time, I you know I'd had two discs removed and my spine fused. It was like clearly it was time for me to 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 stop. And actually, that was the catalyst to starting this business. I mean, literally, I was in Warwick Hospital with a notepad when I came up with this idea. Okay, interesting. Okay. So one led to the other. So I, I I didn't really have much of a time to. I went straight from finishing to going. I've got this guy idea. Right, that that was my focus then. Recovery and how do I expand on this? Wow. Okay. So, okay. Well, that's 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 great to hear. That that positive mindset then obviously served you really well because I'm sure many yeah. people would uh, could find themselves in a bit of a, a difficult place in that sort of situation. Because we was playing at that level of rugby kind of a long term plan. I mean, did sport, competitive sport, play a, a kind of key role throughout your life up until that point? 
Um, yeah, very much so. And actually probably more than most people are aware of because it's not overly something I talk about. So if I go back a little bit further, so I, I'm, I'm adopted. Um, uh, lovely, I was adopted when I was about seven. Um, parents fostered me and, and then adopted me. And, you know, my f- initial start to life wasn't great. You know, not not the place to go into it, but probably most things that where your head goes, I've I've had done. Um, so my my parents were like, oh, you know, big boisterous kid. He's got such a, you know, vibrant zest for life. But my word, is he got some <laughs> some energy. Yeah. So seven years old, they put me into into rugby, and I I'm still in in touch with my coach from when I was sort of seven to fourteen, because that for me was what. Uh, was the catalyst to build everything in my life. The structure, and, you know, I've got a son now who, you know, he likes football. But for me, I think that team sport, the camaraderie, the challenges, the knocks, the ups, the downs, the, the good weather, the cold cold weather, mm-hmm. that whole thing, I think, for certain people, but certainly for me, it was a, a perfect focus that kept me um, on, a, on a straight course of which I could have gone off at any point. Yeah, uh, interesting, wow. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. So that competitive uh, streak then started from an early age, and that's obviously yeah. served you well to to today, I would say. Uh, yeah, very much so. And um, you yeah, know, my brother's the same. So again, brother's adopted, not biological brother. He was very sporty. I think my parents very much had a let's get these two boys into sport pretty early. He was basketball. Um, I was rugby, but. You know, we we'd spend weekends playing together all the time, and and we were competitive against each other. I'm two and a half years older, but he was better at basketball than me, which really pissed me off, right? So <laughs> I then try harder to be better. I had the size advantage in rugby, so he was never going to be better than me. But yeah, I, I think just I think sports good good for that all, all through. It's not just about the competitive piece; it's about understanding how to take knocks and then get back up and go again. Yeah. So if if then the the rugby led directly into endurance zone so i guess then while you were still playing rugby because i think your first let's say professional role was actually at a company called samurai sports mm. where you were a sales rep yeah yeah correct so kind of looking back at that period obviously you know sales has somehow played a, a key role throughout your career yeah. again to where you are today but what were the kind of takeaways when you look back at that period and in fact maybe more specifically you've talked before about the fact that when you're in that role you actually found it quite easy yeah and so I'm wondering what were you doing that kind of made it easy for you what what was it that you were like okay I I can do this this is easy was it just a mindset thing or was it yeah how why did it why was it easy for you do you know we still have this conversation in our offices now. So we've just, just come out of a board meeting this afternoon. We were talking about this. And some of the clients that we've got coming on board that we really shouldn't probably be winning at our size versus their size. And we are saying about it, it's down to, um, I think a lot of salespeople can take it very seriously. right? They're, yes, there's KPIs. There's always going to be KPIs. There's always going to be targets you've got to hit. But at the, fundamentally, sales is about relationships. And... We are big believers across the business and always from a young age for me, it's been about build the relationship with somebody. If you've got the product that they want, fine. But if you've got a product that, you know, it takes Samurai, there's Samurai, there's Akuma, there's Cougar, there's Canterbury, they all do the same, right? Pricing's pricing, they're all much of a muchness. Those people are just going to buy you. So my big thing was hard work and effort. So I'd be traveling to rugby clubs evenings weekends you know you think rugby clubs they train on a tuesday and a thursday a lot of the guys and girls that were the sales reps would be going out to somebody's office seeing the club chairman you know at a, at a table somewhere i'd go in the evening i'd see the lads i'd talk to them i'd swap war stories about when i was at england and i was doing this and that they know then that you're one of them mm. and then it was about really just that relationship led to actually i like this guy i want to work with this guy you know and that's that fundamentally that also is what works in our, our business you know and we'll, I'm sure we'll touch on this so I don't want to jump too far ahead but you know we hire very much based on the personality than the yeah. the um, experience that they've got because we can train our product we can train what you're selling yeah. it's down to can you build relationships with people are you likable can you network in a, in a non-networky way if you yeah. know what I mean yeah. um, and I, I've always been that way I, I'm a sociable person i love learning about other people's journeys and jobs yeah. and what they do and yeah if you can get on with somebody they'll want to work with you yeah 
Absolutely. And that probably leads then quite nicely into your your next uh, your next role. So you moved, I think, from a samurai into recruitment. So you yeah. work with Michael Page. <clears throat> so obviously one of the largest recruitment businesses globally. Yeah. And I think you were you were working on senior finance roles for like the big the top four, the big four yeah. consulting agencies. So yeah. maybe looking back at that period, because you were there for what, four, five years? Yeah. Yeah. Um What's what would you say is the the best and the worst about that your time there in recruitment? Yeah. Okay. So if I if I talk about the the, the journey when we say about that sort of journey competitive piece to Michael Page, you know I'd gone from selling team wear into rugby clubs and swapping war stories, and then I was kind of like I've got to grow up a bit here. You know, I can't be doing this when I'm 80. I need to think about, you know, my long-term career. I remember going to Michael Page and saying, look, you yeah, know, rugby, I've been w- w- sales at Samurai. Had the stats of top sales, salesman for four years on the bounce. So had that. And they went, well, do you know, we, we, we really like sports people here. You know, we're all about, you know, targets and, you know, rewarding people for doing well. And we've always got league tables and sports people play into that quite well. And I remember going in and them saying like, you know, come in for an interview if you thought about recruitment. And I said, well, I haven't, but yeah, okay. So interviewed with Louise, um, who was my manager at the time in Leicester. And she said, well, look, second stage would be with our our director, Sean, but he happens to be upstairs. Do you, do you want to meet him? I was like, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, fantastic. So bearing in mind, I told my wife, I'm going to pop in for an hour to see these guys. I then met Sean. Again, great guy. Learned an awful lot from, from Sean. Um, I think I spent maybe an hour with him. And he said, look, what we now would do with role play, you know, and it's that kind of, I want you to come in, I'm going to be recruiting for a job and I want you to kind of, you know, open questions and fact find about that. But you need to do it with our uh, sort of area MD, um, Steve. Uh, he happens to be upstairs today. Um, do, you, do you want to meet him? But you need to go away and prep. And I was like, yeah, sure. They're like, right, well, there's a cafe across the road. And I was like, yeah, yeah, great. Okay. So seven hours in this whole interview person, by the end of it, they'd offered me the job. But again, I think it's that mentality of, oh, let's go. Yeah, this is great. What's the yeah. worst that can happen here? You know, they either give you some positive feedback or they give you some constructive feedback. Yeah. So, but recruitment is a different kettle of fish when it comes to sales. Yeah. Michael Page is a different kettle of fish when it comes to, um, again, recruitment. They are one of the big boys. They are very KPI driven. They churn through staff. I'm not necessarily saying that's a negative because I, I learned a hell of a lot there, but it was it was hard work mm. it was very much how many phone calls have you made today how many cvs have you sent out of um prospective candidates to you know audit tax directors they're not expecting it you don't you know you're just specking them they're you're specking them out mm. all your follow-ups but it was so kpi number driven process driven that again you learned an awful lot during that and you can take then the positives again well that actually worked really well that spec in CVs and cold calling people and stuff like that, the way that they did it wasn't right because it was just numbers. There was no relationship, no personality behind it. It was just cool, no. Did you want, did you like that CV? No. Did, did you need somebody right now? Okay, you're on to the next one. So mm. it really positive in terms of their structure. I mean, before you even touched a phone, phone there, you did, a, they called it Sales Academy. You were down in London. It was a whole week. You were doing role play. You are doing open questions, closed questions. They got you doing Myers-Briggs training. So, I mean, in terms of a sales process structure, I'd advise anybody to go and spend some time on Michael Page and then go and use that to create something yourself. Considering what you know now, if you went back into recruitment today, what would you do differently? Oh, um... <clears throat> I do more events and I would work with less clients and land and expand as you would call it. So it was very much about these are all recruitment terms that you probably don't do yourself. So I would never say that you would, but spray and pray was always the thing that say, here's a CV, send it to a hundred people. It's just a numbers game. Something's going to stick, but actually you might have annoyed 90% of those people that go, do you know what? You're not, you're not a, you're not a true recruiter. You don't really understand my needs. You don't really understand my business. You're just kind of hoping that I'm going to bite on this CV. And do you know what? It works. Michael Page built global empire out of it, right? Mm. But for me, it would be 
boutique it would be tailored towards a handful of clients mm. that you had their trust they didn't go anywhere else you knew exactly what their business did you knew exactly the culture that they've got the types of people that work and then when you when you pick the phone up and say i've got somebody here for you um they listen yeah uh, and funnily enough i recruited when i was doing industry finance for the last sort of part of um my career there i placed a finance director into national grid I then pulled him out of National Grid and put him into Goodyear. He was then at Goodyear for uh, around two years, uh, uh, no, three years. Um, Fantastic job for them, great reference. He now is my finance director. So when I needed a finance director, and I I grew quite a good relationship with him, so I didn't know him from Adam, but he liked cycling, I was into cycling. And I remember saying to him, look, I'm at this point now where I'm going to raise money. I'd I'd love you to just have a glance over my, um, my deck and give me some advice. <clears throat> and then um yeah roll on past the investment and stuff and then said look i need a finance director and he turned up at my house to tell me that he didn't think i was ready and then went away with the job <laughs> and um he's been instrumental in getting us to where we are today but again if you weren't relationship led you wouldn't have you wouldn't be having a finance director that you placed into a role four years ago or whatever yeah. it was seven years ago interesting oh well that's good to hear um, because i would like to hope that that's definitely my my approach um, yeah but yeah there's still a lot of yeah quite shoddy kind of tactics unfortunately used in the recruitment world which gives gives us a little bit of a bad reputation with some people yeah. which is pretty frustrating but but i do i do think that covid reset that a little bit because a lot of people lost their jobs across industry across you know practice in terms of finance uh, and even recruiters themselves you know lo- lost their job so when you came back out the back of this, and I've got still a few friends that are in recruitment have done very well, it forced you to actually go and build relationships with people again because the person that you used to deal with was no longer there. Yeah. And actually you don't know where they are anymore because they might not have a job or they might have gone somewhere else and you've got to redo that. So it kind of almost reset people a little bit to become more relationship-led and not just chucking CVs out of door. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... Let's move on to Endurance Zone. So, uh, yes, Endurance Zone is the largest rewards and loyalty platform in in, in the world now. Um, We are a white-label tech solution that offers uh, rewards and loyalty platforms white-labeled for gyms, health clubs, um, governing bodies, sports organizations all over the world. So used by those clients in different ways. If you're looking at retention, uh, the platform has ways that can aid your retention strategies. If it's engagement, yes. If it's driving brand awareness, advertising, um, gamification, the platform allows you to do all of that. So again, that consultative piece we were talking about is we'll go into a uh, a gym and say, look, what, what, what are the behaviors that you're trying to promote? What is the... Um, you know, what are the challenges you're facing and how can we help you? So we'll always start a call going, look, I could show you our platform, but it does a million weird and wonderful things, mm-hmm. right? Tell me what your problem is and we'll then be able to navigate you through our platform to say, look, this is a solution that will help you with it. Obviously, building something like that, there's a massive amount of back-end work. Yep. But when you started, was it in your mind already that, okay, this is going to take several years before yep. we kind of get to market? Yeah, so do you know, People ask me this question because when you look at, say, my LinkedIn, it will show that, and then our platform went live in September 21. But actually, there's a slight journey there. So, you know, when I had my back surgery, I was told that look, running, rugby, those forms of modality are are now done. You need to ideally cycling, right? Low impact, great recovery. You know, as you sort of lean forward, it opens up the vertebrae in your back, which will support that sort of operation piece you've had. And the doctor said, like, go and join British Cycling. They're bound to give you loads of benefits to you know, start you on this new journey. So I thought, okay, cool. Yeah, I like cycling. So went to join British Cycling. But unless I wanted a magazine or a, or a cycling holiday, there, there weren't any benefits. And I was expecting you know, bikes, glasses, helmets, nutrition, uh, and there wasn't. I was then at a gym that were, you know, serving me rewards, but they were Papa John's Pizza and Starbucks. And it was this kind of aha moment of going, well, look, if you're a, if you're a health organization, you're a, you're a membership platform that's built around that sport, surely your 
off, wanting to offer them something that was actually tangible to the audience as opposed to just putting up some rewards and pretending that it's a benefit to people. So because I was interested in cycling, I had this idea to go, well, actually, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to focus on building out a, a cycling network. And I called the business Discount Cycling Network. Mm-hmm. So I'd sit there, you know, in my lunch breaks and stuff, flicking through magazines, cold calling the likes of Halfords and Muckoff and specialised bikes, going, look, I'm going to build out this, this platform where cyclists are going to join to get these discounts. Now, what I've seen in the industry is there's lots of affiliates out there and if you can offer a 10% discount and somebody's taking a 10% commission, that's not that valuable. And if you can Google it, consumer-wise, again, that's not that valuable. So do you know what? don't pay me a commission. Give me 20% discount instead or whatever it would be. They give me the high discount. And they go, well, how are you going to make money? And I go, well, don't worry about that at the moment. But if I can then give all these you know, really big offers that people go, wow, I can't find them online – it's going to create that sort of membership of people coming in going, wow, I'm getting real benefit here. So short version is I did that and I had about 50, 60 cycling brands. And in 18 months, I had more members logging into my little crappy Wix site that I'd built um, to get access to all of my discounts, which was more than British Cycling's membership. Mm. So I went back to British Cycling and said, hey, I've cracked it, guys. I've figured something out here. Why, why don't you license this off me? And they said, look, we love it. We, we really like that but we don't want to send people to you. We want to keep people in our world and we want to understand our members more. How could you do that? And that was around 2020 as COVID was starting to kick off. And I used that time to then go, do you know what? That's actually a really good business model there. Mm. You know, if we could find a white label solution that we could build into other people's apps, other people's websites that looked and felt like them, single sign on so again that user journey is great for you join british cycling you log into your membership platform hey there's a there's all your rewards you click on it and there's a whole host of rewards that are really valuable to you that's going to work mm. and we launched in september 21 our first white label platform and we signed our first client in september 21 which was yellow jersey bike insurance um we signed a contract with them for three years and then they renewed again um, afterwards and then since then we've kind of replicated and learnt as talking to a gym that's very different to a governing body and say well actually for us you know we've got off peak members and we want to add value to them but we've got peak members and we want to add more value to them mm. and we want to move people from that bucket to that bucket how do we do that and then we've gone on to develop parts of technology like locking rewards so that you can show off peak members you know, 40% off Garmin, but when you click on it, it says, hey, upgrade to peak membership to unlock this reward, so mm. helping drive those behaviours. So as we've gone through different industries, different markets, different clients, we've learned different things that they've wanted to achieve and then built the technology around that. Okay, amazing, amazing. So so actually then it it, it maybe didn't seem like then such a long time from, from when you first started that. So... Because otherwise I was thinking, wow, you know, from a motivation point of view to kind of from the start to that point must have been quite challenging. But it sounds like you uh, you had a few, let's say, deviations to the plan as it went along. Mm-hmm. And you, as you said, you learned from, from what you were being told. Yes, but at the same time, I'd say you still very much need that motivation. Because having got 187,000 people to sign up for my discount cycling network to then have to completely rebrand... Mm. lose all of those members effectively and then turn it into a b2b and taking that leap of faith when everybody Mm. was losing their jobs during covid i i had my job and i quit and then i spent all my life savings Mm. (laughs) and i've got a very lovely wife who backs me on it so again that motivation but i think it's because I'd, i'd seen you know i'd been told by a a reputable governing body that actually do you know what we could use that technology. We haven't seen anything like that, but we want it white labeled and we want it in our platform. And it was that kind of catalyst to go, there's a need there. Let's go and see what we can do. Looking back in those early years, what were the what were the biggest challenges that you that you didn't expect? What were the things that were like, oh, okay, look, that kind of came out of nowhere and what, what really challenged you there that was that was a surprise? There's two things, and it sounds it sounds like, and I need to get across it. It sounds like I'm trying to say everything's super positive with work, right? And business is ah, oh, it's all rosy. It's bloody not right when you when you're working all hours under the sun. And I think everybody that's ever started a business knows you're the you're the cleaner, you're the chef, you're the salesperson, the accountant, all of that kind of stuff. 
But I'd say actually it's the scaling very quickly and it was kind of taking a product to market that people wanted very quickly. We actually needed to raise money pretty quickly mm -hmm. because we actually needed um, more resource because we'd gone, done the hard yards of selling this and building this off our own, you know, bootstrapped it for three, four years ourselves, you know, okay. hired a few members of staff, Myself, and my co-founder weren't paying each other for to, to each other for for two years. We were paying our, our staff instead. But then we got to a point where, as we started to bring these clients on board, we were like, Do you know, what? actually, we need somebody operationally to onboard these people. We we need more tech resource here because we're very limited in terms of what we know, and they're telling us they need points APIs and they need gamification and wearables and we're out of our depth here, we need to hire somebody. Otherwise, all the hard work we've just done is gonna come tumbling down because the service levels won't be there. Mm. Um, and that was one of the hardest things because I think it's very, I think it's very easy to go and get money. But actually, if you're, if you're scaling, you want the right money. Mm. You want people that certainly from an angel perspective can help you on the journey, can understand the journey that you're going on, can offer you just, can offer you insight and advice, not just cash. And I think that was very important for for us was that we got the right investors on board. So that that first bit was tough because it's a long process trying to get investment and building out data rooms and you know forecasting you know five years in advance with a finger in the air. You know yeah. it, it's hard work. So that was a really challenging piece for us. Mm. Um, and then it was about hiring the right people. And you'd think as a recruiter, that was an easy thing to do. But actually, because in the early days, we still probably didn't know who we were. We knew there was a, we knew there was a product there. We knew that people wanted it, but we probably still weren't too sure what was our product market fit. Yeah. You know, who were we really targeting here? Which then stops us from going, right, we need these types of people. Um, so they were probably the challenges, but again, we went through the process of getting the investor on first, who then spent six months with us looking at us, going through, you know, what is our pro product market fit? What, what are, get all your ideas out, no idea is a bad idea, and then going, right, that's a really good idea, that's a good one, right, let's laser focus on those first, which then allowed us to go through the recruiting of salespeople, yeah. um, operational people, brand yeah. managers, all of that. Yeah. So you mentioned co-founder there, and and I believe actually you've had at one point you've had two co-founders, and and you you had very complementary skills. Yeah. Uh, you kind of talked about this triangle um, yeah. that you had um, yourself with more kind of sales operations, and one of the, another co-founder with more IT, another one with more marketing. Yeah, that's right. I'm wondering, was that a conscious decision in terms of identifying those people to to be with you as co-founders or was it more about the relationship that you had with them and that you you knew them before and worked with them before or trusted them or whatever or was it really conscious that okay i need somebody with tech i need somebody with marketing uh t t two things actually super conscious on one of them so one of my co-founders who's our cmo is ed um, Ed Hollison also happens to be my brother-in-law. Nothing to do with the reason why I hired him, because I, I think I made it very clear on the way in, sort of thing. Business is business and family's family, right? If we fall out on a Friday, we've got a barbecue on a Saturday. I don't expect you to raise anything, <laughs> you know. But it happens that you know, marketing degree, um, work for um, Arden University and a couple of charities, marketing director, you know, SEO skills. Um, he was just the perfect fit for somebody to come in and look at market analysis and look at targeted demographics of clients and all of that kind of stuff. So when I approached him about it, initially he was, you know, I'm not in a position where I'm going to quit my job and, and come and do this, but I'll, I'll give you a bit of guidance and help you sort of thing along the way. And then very soon, I think, again, he saw the opportunity and said, okay, I'm all in on this. And actually, we we outsourced the technology initially, and then we were approached by a, a guy in the states called Todd Jennings, and he ran a OTT platform, uh, which is over the top platform, um, endurance video streaming. So he was an okay. Ironman athlete and tech whiz, and um, he rang me one day. So I've just seen your rewards platform. I'd love this for our our um, our OTT platform. You know, the, the the brands resonate with our audience. And I think over a three month period of me chatting with him, I managed to convince him to quit doing what he'd been doing for the last two years 
and come and join me as a as a co-founder on the technology side and then yes i always explain it's this perfect triangle of you know sales and operations marketing and and technology and i think anybody that runs a business or or is looking at running a business the the first approach is identify what your skills are and be really honest with yourself about what you're good at and what you're not good at yeah and the bits that you're not good at go and find somebody that is yeah yeah interesting okay and that then that lens brings us back maybe full circle to to recruiting now so i'm really interested to know are you taking anything that you learned from your recruitment days into your recruitment process now when you're building out your team um yeah so you're right before you mentioned about i i recruited senior finance positions audit tax into big four and then moved into cfos and fds into into industry and in that basis there was a mix of very much uh, qualifications and then skill set and i would say none of that because finance people are not sales people right and in a scaling business we needed sales people and they're very different people but one of the things that i guess resonated with me was there were one or two candidates that i had tom who's our finance director being one of them that had personality and i think for me it was kind of I remember Paula, who was his line manager at um, Goodyear, saying, John, he's a great guy. He would fit in perfectly with the rest of our team here. So I think for me, and I mentioned it previously, it's about personalities and people that fit within our business. You know, we don't overly take ourselves too seriously. You know, we're not all buttoned up with ties and uh, and suits and stuff you know we, we we go and work out with our clients we go on bike rides you know we've done paddle boarding with our clients you know we wanted people that can fit in work hard are driven are competitive my god we need competitive people um and that was what was important so uh, it kind of a yes and a no like it, it's interesting but I don't care about qualifications, which I think in Michael Page it was very much like what, what are the qualifications, what, what university have they been to? Yeah. But for me, I, I don't care. I never went to university. I never did A-levels. I went straight into you know playing rugby and then working, but by Christ, I work hard. Yeah. And that was more, that's more important. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that answers your question or not really. But Yeah, it does. But so, <clears throat> so when you're, obviously personality then is, is critical for you and that ability to, to fit with the team and within the culture of the business yeah. that you've just well just described. But how are you, how are you identifying that? Because a lot of times that's, that's here, right? Yeah. It's the gut, yeah. which isn't, in my experience, a hundred percent reliable. Hundred <laughs> yeah, percent, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So true. So yeah, I'm interested. You know, is it kind of really down to 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 that kind of gut feeling, or is there anything else you're doing to kind of help identify those people? Yeah. So we'll get to know people. So we never, I believe, and I don't use recruiters mm. because, I, again, I don't want to see a load of CVs. So we'll we'll meet people. And they might be working in a gym. They might be working a, a brand that we work with or something. But you know when you go to a networking event or you turn up at an expo and you get on this person and you end up having a having a bit of dinner or a beer or whatever it might be and you just kind of keep an eye on them and go, do you know what? I like that guy or girl. You know, it's um, they could be good for our business. And then, and then you kind of start planting the seeds. And we've got a couple of people at the moment that we're looking at. And we've planted the seeds probably six months ago. Go, do you know what? I'd, I'd definitely hire you, you know, like, oh, well, really? Well. And then the next conversation you have, they're like, so are, are you hiring? And you're like, well, we will be, yeah. We're looking at you know, adding some more heads in for 25. That's, that's, you know, I can't promise anything, but let's, let's have a coffee. And you just start to spend some time with these people over a six-month or three-month period, and I will generally get a pretty good feel as to whether they're, yeah. they're right. And then now I'll put them in front of some of the other team. But the people that we've hired, we've invited them out for dinners twice, generally, um, before they even get an offer. Okay. We'll say, hey, come out and meet the team. Like, this has got to be, re- this has got to be right for you. you know, chat to the team. Get, you know, Ask them questions about what it's like to work here, what we're doing, what we're building, what I'm like to work for. And it gives them an opportunity. And also, I then get to say to someone, what do you think? Well, a bit, bit shy, a bit quiet, said this, said that. But fortunately, the feedback's been like, yeah, you know, seems really good. Yeah. There's only been once that we hired somebody that had loads of industry experience that we thought was going to be good because they had the industry experience and they knew everybody. But actually, that didn't work because they knew everybody and they knew him, yeah. good and bad. Yeah. That's funny because I... 
I've made the same mistake back in the day uh, when I was working for a brand. And yeah, on paper, you know, the amazing experience, amazing connections. Yeah. But yeah, it it just didn't work. Um, you can have all it, the connections in the world, yeah. but if you don't know how to, you don't know how to use them or work yeah. with them. Yeah, it's useless, really. And I, I've said this to the team several times. One of the big advantages we have in this space is people that have been in this space, this loyalty and rewards in in this specific industry that we've been in, have either done it very badly and they've gone, um, or they're doing it very badly. One of the benefits that we've got is taking people outside of the industry. We've not been in this industry. No one knows us really apart from what we do now. Nobody knows my staff apart from that they've worked at Endurance Zone in this industry. And that seems to be holding us in good stead because, again, we are heavily service-led, heavily relationship-led. And that's working because people can't go, oh, I remember you from Les Mills or this gym and, you know, oh, I didn't like it. What are you selling now? You know, mm. sort of thing. We've kind of got these fresh eyes of people coming yeah. in with a fresh business. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Interesting. So, well, maybe connected a little bit to that and connected to those opportunities to network. I know that you're you're keen on doing well this sort of thing first of all so mm -hmm. so podcasts and you've done i know you've done some public speaking you were yep. at the running industry alliance conference last year or the year before yeah you know, whenever yeah whenever it was so what do you get out of that i mean is that again just an opportunity to start kind of sowing the seed with particular people or it's really about selling the business or you know putting yourself out there all that to all the time especially in your position now when you know you have a lot of other topics I'm sure on your mm. on your desk so why is it important for you that you're still still out there kind of doing that so I think some people think and I had a comment with somebody goes gosh you do a lot of speaking and you're at this fitness expo on stage doing this or that it's the it's actually the opposite from the public piece of like brand awareness is great and all that but actually the bits that I like is you get to talk to so many people that you understand. So when you explain what you do, they'll go, do you know what? We've been looking for something like that, but actually we need it to do this. And I see it as a massive information gathering piece. And you're right, the running industry conference is a really interesting one. So um, I'm not sure when this podcast will go out, but I've just been appointed to their board. Um, so Bex invited me to come in and join their board because it's she said, look, it's your you're good at sort of listening to people and actually it's quite this whole thing is about how do we improve the running industry and being able to sit there and just have a beer with somebody have a coffee with somebody and say you know, what are your challenges that's the bit that I really like and that's the bit that she'll see value in in me how do we improve the industry together for me those events are just great you just get to meet lots of people you get to talk to lots of people and then you get to take that away and go do you know what I was chatting to this event company over here as an example and one of the biggest things that they say is they're, they're still handing out gift bags and they've got printing and they've got you know protein bars in there and stuff and for us how do how do we how do we turn that into a digital swag bag how do we work with their partners the event partners build that into our reward platform to be able to give to all of their their runners or riders or whatever it may be that ultimately saves them costs helps you helps the environment because we're not pumping loads of stuff into plastic bags mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's just a, that's just one example but yeah. I just like meeting different people. And generally, we'll always say, business does come off the back of it, but we don't necessarily need to always be talking about, yeah. hey, this is what we do, come and talk to us. It's more about just chatting to somebody and saying, well, yeah, what do you do? Yeah. Oh, well, we do this. Yeah. They'll then remember that. They'll come to you when the time's right. Yeah. You know, and maybe you meet them again and say, hey, how, how did that, that thing go that you were talking to me about? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it went well. And then the relationship's going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you've talked in the past about how important your support network is, support group, and particularly calling out your wife. Um, but I'm thinking that, you know, listening to you here, you know, obviously you're the founder and CEO of Endurance Zone. I think you sit on the board of uh, UK Active or yeah. a part of the digital part of UK Active. Yeah, digital futures, yeah. You're joining the RIA yeah. uh, board. Yeah. Um, you're the founder, I think, of the largest cycling club, um, and the largest non-profit cycling club. Yep. You're, you're married, you're a husband, you're a father. Yep. I, I was going to ask, how do you find a balance? Perhaps I should say, do you find a balance? <laughs> <laughs> and then if the answer is yes, how do, you, how do you keep all those 
balls in there and spates spate, spates plates spinning plates spin. <laughs> um i didn't have much of a balance okay and i go through spurts uh where there isn't a balance um but i have a very supportive wife um who is the ceo of our home for sure that's for sure uh, i've got two kids i've got a seven-year-old boy and uh, i've got a 10-month-old little girl um and to be honest i i think um i enjoy what i do for starters mm. Um, I absolutely love it. I, I love the business. I love being with people. I love socialising with people. I love understanding people. It's just what makes me tick. Um, I do a lot of hours, and I, I tend to say to people that I break my hours into two. So you know, I, I'm usually in the office for half eight. So again, I you know, I get to get up. I do you know breakfast with the kids and um, take the dog for a walk and all that kind of stuff, and then come to work go home normal hours you know we go home at half five generally and then i'll have that couple of hours window where we have dinner and we make sure there's no phones there and we have you know put the put the baby millie to uh to bed I absolutely love that because she's at that age where she really you know dad dad dad, dad and you know yeah. come in she lights up that fills me full of joy sure. um so put her to bed and then the person who suffers from it probably is my wife because then i move on to us time and then i'll be probably till half 10, 11 o'clock most nights um, on calls with gyms or whoever it may be. And somebody said to me the other day, well, you need more staff. Like, surely you need to get more staff. I'm like, I'd hire more staff. Great. It's just the way I'm built. I'm still going to then go, right, what what market can we look at now? What can I pick up now? Mm -hmm. Um, As I say, she gets it. She supports me. She knows that I do it for family. I, you know, fortunate enough that we take regular holidays, and I generally don't work on those holidays. I, it, I only take week holidays because if it was two weeks, I'd end up dipping back in. But you know, we're in a position now, and she's been there where it was all hours under the sun. But we're in a position now where we have the staff, we have the infrastructure. I've got my leadership team. I trust my leadership team. That actually, you know, the other, I, I put one phone call into Tim, our ops director, when I was in Ibiza earlier in the, in the year, and he, he basically said, "What the hell are you calling me?" He said, I don't expect to hear from you again, you know, and that's that's the team you need, right? Yeah. So, um, I think the kids of the kids are the one that did it. I think prior to that, it was all hours under the sun, and my wife paid for it. But yeah. now we have got the kids and families, super important. That's all you do it for, right? Yeah, absolutely. If didn't have the family, I probably wouldn't be as motivated if I'm honest. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. And what about sport? Is the sport still player? an important role in kind of finding that balance because I think you you after rugby which obviously you couldn't do you talked about the fact that you then got into cycling so is cycling yep. still a an important part of your life yeah it, very, very much so and I don't I don't get a chance to do it as often um I used to love running before I had my back you know you could wang a pair of trainers on 30 yeah. 30 minutes 45 minutes you're done cycling not so much tire pressure I'm pumped them up in a few days you know lycra it up do i look good does it match my bike you know it's very important these are very important questions <laughs> to ask before you head out um so i don't do as much as i, I like to but probably three four times um a month i'll get out usually with some friends and then i've got a garmin tax bike at home and you know once or twice a week i'll generally jump on there half an hour in front of the tv just spin the legs clear the head a bit yeah. but you know then i'll once or twice a year do a big challenge so you know last year we did um tour of flanders across the cobbles okay. 100k wow. in the pouring rain what I, I said this the other day um the closest i can um sort of compare to my rugby days freezing cold bitter pain legs hurting can't breathe snotty nose you finished it and you're like i'm dead but by god was it good yeah you know you you finish and you're like oh, i've earned this belgian beer you know this is great. But yeah, Flanders last year, the year before that, I did Von 2 three times in 24 hours. Um, this year, I did um, London to Paris with uh, Chris, our sales director, Ben Foster, the goalie, or ex-goalie, and then Tom uh, Achoe, his commercial guy. Uh, and it was great fun, you know, 400 miles, 500 miles in four days. So it's that kind of stuff. Like I'll always set myself... Um, a big challenge yeah. to do which okay. then kind of forces you to go no you do need to do a bit of training because you, yeah. you might die otherwise <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely now you, you mentioned ben foster there which reminded me of something else that you do as well which is you have your own podcast which <laughs> obviously with 
the co-host of Ben Foster's yeah, podcast. Tom, if I'm, Tom Ochoa, yeah. So, and that's your talk. You're kind of exploring and diving into the the business of sports, right? Yeah. Um, so, so why? What's what kind of led you to do that? So Tom's a, Tom's a really good good friend, and yeah, as you say, he does the um, Ben Foster uh, podcast with Fozcast and the Football Fill In and. You know, him and I go on bike rides and we say, like, oh, did you hear about, you know, Roger Federer's just done a deal with On Running? He's like, yeah, yeah, I wonder how much he's been paid. Why has he done that? And then we were talking about Lewis Reese Samet, who, you know, left playing professional rugby to go and try his hand in the NFL. Yeah. And it's just things we're interested in. You know, one of the, there's a there's a podcast, it's on a, an app called Wondery, and it's like Business Wars, and it's like, you know, the AFL versus the NFL. Um, it's all these different, like, comparisons. I'm just interested in understanding the business makeups and yeah. why people do, you know, why did Tiger Woods leave Nike yeah. to go and start his own brand? It seems a bit silly when he's retiring. What's the plan? So we just said, well, we should, we should talk about it. We should research it, and we should do a podcast called What's the Deal with Sports? We came up with saying, you know, well, you know this week, what's the deal with Michael Jordan? What's the deal with... You know, Formula One, what's the deal with Red Bull? You know, yeah. and we delve into these things where people go, Wow, I didn't know that Red Bull just moved into cycling. And we'd go into, Well, why? What was the strategic move and why have they done it? And how much have they paid for it? And kind of unwrapping the business behind sport. Yeah. And it was a bit of an escape, you know, for me to not be talking about rewards and loyalty and engagement. And, and again, for Tom, not to be talking about football and goalkeeping and you know all of this kind of stuff and it, it, it did all right you know our first video did twenty five thousand yeah. views and then thirty thousand view and now now you know all the socials and stuff we've got out were at millions of views and yeah. it just kind of worked and um we just enjoy it. it took a bit of a hiatus over the the summer just because of kids and holidays and stuff and then we've just just recorded four more this week um but yeah, just really, cool. really interested in it. It's worth put, you know worth putting it out there. And again, I think it positions selfishly myself in that kind of thought leadership thing. You know, yeah. I'm not just playing around at this. I'm genuinely interested in business and yeah. sport and how things work and how we connect people together and how we can, you know, Im improve the industry really through various different things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, it's great. Well, I've listened to the. Um to the Wrexham episode and <laughs> and one other which now I escaped from the Masters. but yeah no it's cool it's uh it's the Masters it's golf one seemed to everybody seemed to really enjoy that the mystique behind the Masters and all yeah. the crazy rules and that there's hidden speakers that play bird music uh, like bird oh, chirping, I haven't listened to that one I'll have to they, check it out they put dye in the lakes in all the lakes at Augusta to make them stand out on TV it's a really good one because it's things like that you watch it yeah. and if you ever watch it you're like nobody's carrying a bag but they make like 13 million pounds in four days in in selling caps and stuff but you never see anybody with any bags so there's all these rules around what people can, can and can't do it's really, but that's it it's really yeah. interesting to to I'll check that one out. So I'm interested. We're well, looking back over your career. Who are the people that have most influenced you? Would you say purely career-wise, or just in in general? General, yeah. Um, rugby coach at my local rugby Kenilworth down the road. A guy called Mark Juby. Literally, I'd say like most of my childhood structure and competitiveness and. Uh, and and any rugby career I had was probably owed to him. He was probably the first sort of mentor in that sense. Yeah. Um, again, you know, can't take anything away from from Michael Page. You know, I had some really good managers. Um, Louise Sean, as I mentioned before, a director who's now MD out in in the US. You know, he was a great mentor for me. That was kind of a balance between. Again, he worked hard, balanced it with family. Um, very structured he'd be really honest with me in terms of you've done that wrong but this is why you know straight from the hip I really appreciated that and then to be honest I've got I've got a really good board I've got two angels that sit on my board one is the founder of WorldPay a guy called David Sear um, he took a very early interest in what we were doing and gave up a lot of his time in just mentorship without putting any money in and you, know, you could look at that and say well, he was just keeping close to whether he thought you were going to do well and came in at the right time. But he didn't need to do that. You know, he's a busy guy, you know. So 
Um, he's been great, and he sits on our board. He's you know he's just been in the board meeting with us. Always comes up with good ideas, support, which is probably more my my dad. Like my 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 dad's always been my my sort of role model mentor because I mean like he adopted me and my brother. You know he was born last end of Sheffield. You know um, went out to London, worked for an oil company for thirty years, retired at fifty five as a director still found the time and it's only when I had kids I realised what he gave up you know he drove me over to Leicester for rugby training on a Thursday afterwards just sat there in the car reading a book came back and then went to work the next day then drove me all over the bloody country uh, on a Saturday for various games and it's only when you've got kids and you drop them off at football you think fucking hell <laughs> how did he do this when I had training on a Tuesday a Thursday and then when it was county and midland season it was Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Saturday Sunday yeah. you know it's things like that that you just go but that's why you do it. you work hard for your kids right yeah absolutely so, absolutely but and what's but yeah. the what's the best piece of advice you've ever received hmm uh, fail fast learn quick okay and do you do you feel like you you're able to action that? Yeah, I think there's a, there's the old Facebook saying, isn't there? That's like move fast and break stuff, um, which is very similar. And I think we learn quickly, you know, we pivot quickly, and I think that's what's kind of aided us to our growth of where we are now. Is that you know we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, we spent a lot of money on things that we thought were the right things to spend money on, and they, and they weren't right. Mm -hmm. um, but we learned from it very quickly. We pivoted very quickly, um, and I think the whole business is the same. What if you could give future leaders within the sports and the outdoor industry three pieces of advice? What would you? What pearls of wisdom would you share? <laughs> <laughs> pearls of wisdom. I'm not too sure. <laughs> Um, one of one for sure would just be that don't don't be scared to give it a go. Don't be scared to try something. If you've got an idea, there's a million reasons why you shouldn't do something. You only need one to say give it a go, and it goes back to that you know, you know, fail fast and learn quick uh, mentality. Um, but yeah, definitely don't be scared to give it a go, for sure. Relationships are key. You you know, find your advocates, find your partners, find the people that understand and believe in what you're doing, and work with them and I guess the third piece I'd just say <laughs> it's a really cliche one but just work hard like mm. there's no substitute for hard work and I think everybody said that and I'm probably going to get people going oh here we go here we go but there there, there isn't if, if you for can sure. if you can learn fast you know if you can learn quick and fail fast but you work hard um that's it. So, see, uh, do you know what? I'm going to give you four. So that that last one could be that, or it could be the other side of it. Is just um, back yourself. Just, talk, just back yourself and go. Like it's it's yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to think if there's more. Like if I if I could go back and tell myself, it definitely be like hard work's going to work. Back yourself to do it. Don't be scared to fail, and if you do, just learn bloody quick. Yeah. So if today was your last day, if you were going to hang up your uh, endurance zone boots and yeah. retire on an island somewhere, yeah. what would your, your message be to your team? Well, this depends whether I'm on a deserted island because it's failed and I'm on my own or whether it's a, an island like Richard Branson. Um, let's say it's the, the, the latter, right? We've, we've done a good job. We've sold it or whatever that may be. We've got no plans for that. But, you know, um, if we've sold it, um thank you is all you're ever going to need to say you know uh, again i might have had the idea and we always have this i've got weird and wonderful ideas and i'm always like what if we could do this would it improve the platform if we did this and i've got the team there that can tell me whether we can deliver on it whether we should deliver on it you know they've done their their work to tell me actually that client yes no we wouldn't be and i keep looking over there because my office is over there right and i can see my my team has got a big leadership day tomorrow um it's just thanks for trusting me because you know they challenge me on things when they when it's right to do so but a lot of times i come in and say deliver the message this month this quarter budgets whatever it might be and they just go with me and i'm going to take that as a positive that they trust me but it'll just be a massive thank you like if we have got to that point where we've done an exit or we we haven't you know we've just got a great lifestyle business that gives everybody a great life 
not going to be here and I've done it on my own and it would never be here if I hadn't got the right people in yeah, um, yeah. perfect we're not there yet though we've got a long way to go yet <laughs> great well look thanks very much for your time Dave and sharing so many great insights I think there's uh, a lot of value there for people to, to take away so I appreciate you being so open and honest about everything and, uh, and good luck for the coming months and years and uh, yeah thanks again <laughs> No, I really appreciate it. If anybody wants to reach out and have a chat, get some advice, I can give them advice, they can give me advice, I'd love to hear from them. Perfect. Well, we'll put your um, your LinkedIn profile in the show notes so people can send you a message through LinkedIn. Awesome. Perfect. Cheers, All right. Dave. Cheers, Dave. Cheers, mate. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Dave as much as I did. If you did, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Thanks for your support, and I look forward to seeing you soon for our next episode.